Thank you, Professor Quigley, for the introduction. And thank you all for coming. I mean, the America's Cup is some distraction. <laughs> so it's wonderful to see you all here. And I must say, it is really wonderful for me uh, to be here in New Zealand. Actually, tomorrow marks six months since uh, my wife, Professor Sarah Strasser, who's here, she's the Dean of the uh, Te Huataki Waiora School of Health. Uh, and, and so she and I had completed our two weeks of hotel isolation and we set foot in New Zealand two weeks ago tomorrow. I mean, two month, six months ago tomorrow. And that was after six months almost of, of uh, being locked down, working from home in Australia. So it certainly is wonderful to be here. And I really appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, talk with you today uh, about rural medical education and how rural medical education helps improve healthcare for all. What I'm going to do is, first of all, explore healthcare and what we expect of healthcare, people everywhere expect of healthcare, and then look at the realities of rural health. Then I'm going to talk about medical education and, and developments in the last uh, 100 years, including, of course, rural medical education. And then I'm going to introduce you to the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, which is a, a new medical school, relatively new medical school, uh, in, in rural Canada. So what do we expect? What, if, you, if you think about it, what, what do you expect? What do we expect of, of healthcare? And I would say people everywhere expect high quality healthcare close to home. In other words, accessible healthcare. We expect that if we're unlucky enough to be seriously ill or injured, then the system is there to save us. And of course, we expect care for uh, all kinds of, of health problems, acute and, and chronic health problems, and that the system is encouraging, promoting good health uh, for, for everybody and, and with a focus on, on the needs of individuals and as part of society. So I'd suggest that's, that's what we expect of healthcare. So what's the situation for rural health? And I would say that it was something of a surprise uh, to us back in 1996. Uh, it was about 300 of us for, uh, rural practitioners from 30 different countries. We came together in China for the, what became the first World Rural Health Conference. And we found that even though there's so many obvious differences from one country to another in terms of, 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 of ge geography and, and, and climate and economic development levels and so on, there are some very common themes that are true around the world. Access is the rural health issue. Even in countries where most of the people live in rural areas, the resources are concentrated in the cities. There are always transport and communication difficulties between one rural area and another, and certainly between the rural areas and, and the urban areas, and there are never enough uh, health workforce. So that was something we discovered when we came together back in 1996. Over the last two decades, there's a, a evidence really accumulated that's shown that people living in rural and remote parts of the world, generally their health status is worse than people living in the cities. So what about the healthcare providers, the rural practitioners? When compared to their, their city counterparts, Rural practitioners provide a wider range of services, carry a higher level of clinical responsibility in relative professional isolation. And that's true, talking about not just doctors, but all the specialties in medicine, so general practitioners, surgeons, pediatricians. It's also true talking about other health professionals, like nurses and pharmacists and, and physiotherapists. And because most rural practitioners, or often rural practitioners, live in the community they serve, they have the opportunity to influence the health of the whole community, not just in terms of individual interactions with, with, with uh, people as patients and, and families, but the whole community level. And actually the best example that I know of that is a doctor in a small country town in inland South Australia, who was so effective in presenting the message of the connection between red meat and cholesterol and heart disease, 
that the butcher shop started selling fish. So what about health services for people living in, in rural communities? I've already highlighted uh, that access is, is the issue, and I've mentioned uh, the safety net, that we all have a security need, really, wherever we live. Now, in the cities, of course, there are ambulances and emergency departments, and so, you know, it's, no, it's not the, a big issue, really, you'd like to think, anyway. But in rural areas, that, that safety net can't be taken for granted. And so there is a preoccupation with doctors and hospitals and uh, amongst uh, people living in rural areas. There's also a desire to be looked after by people they know close to home. And it certainly can't be assumed that people living in remote and rural communities actually will travel. I mean, I, I was in rural practice in Australia for nearly two decades, and twice I had people choose to go blind rather than travel two hours to the nearest eye specialist. I mentioned already the limited resources and, and, uh, and the shortage of, of workforce, but I think the bottom line is that taking models of ser health service delivery from the cities and somehow trying to sort of modify them and make them fit in the rural areas doesn't work. The health services that work best for rural communities are those the models that are developed in the community by the community for the community. So how does this relate to New Zealand? Well, uh, last year there was the uh, Simpson Report, the Health and Disability System Review Report. And what do you know? People living in rural towns have a poorer health status, uh, including lower life expectancy than people living in the cities or the surrounding districts of the cities. And that's even more so for Māori and disabled people. I, I think they didn't really look at Pacific, but it's true for Pacific peoples as well. And what about rural practitioners? Well, in New Zealand, they have different roles, often a broader scope of practice. So the description that I've given about rural health and rural practice around the world is also true for New Zealand. So let's move on to medical education. And it was in 1910, a chap called Abraham Flexner, who was an educationalist, present, presented his report, which was a, the result of a review of medical education in North America, so the United States and Canada. And Flexner recommended that all medical education should be university-based and there should be the connection made between science and medicine. So that the first half of the medical education program should occur at the university and focused on the basic sciences explanatory to medicine, and then the second half of the medical education program in the teaching hospital. So I have to say, of course, uh, in the United States, the teaching hospital was a relatively new phenomenon, and, and Flexen knew about uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University and Medical School and Teaching Hospital, which was actually modeled on the German model of medical education. So they'd been teaching hospitals in Europe for centuries, but it was a new idea in North America. And the reason that Flexner uh, particularly recommended that was that, that the doctors, the physicians in these teaching hospitals used the scientific method, both in terms of their, their clinical care and, and research. And so that's the, the, the Flexner model became the standard model of medical education for the world, partly because Flexner presented his report in New York, then got on a ship and, and presented his report in London and then got another ship and went to Berlin. And so uh, this model was ado adopted and spread around the world very, very quickly and still is the standard model of medical education uh, around the world. But if you think about teaching hospitals and, and the developments in the 20th century, of science and technology and, and, uh, and medical care and, and the use of technology and specialties and subspecialties, teaching hospitals have sort of grown and developed and become this, this sort of huge uh, edifice, really, and become the temples through which you must pass to become a physician, a sort of hallowed place, really, in medical education. And it's true, especially in the latter part of the, the 20th century, uh, there were introduced various rotations away from the teaching hospital into other hospitals and sometimes into other settings 
that we, we call community. But there was this sense that it's kind of a bit like a school excursion. It's a fun thing to do, but it doesn't really count for anything. And meanwhile, uh, the, the principal, uh, the leadership in the, in the teaching hospitals are sub-specialists and they are the principal clinical teachers and ro role models for the medical students. And so wouldn't you know it, most medical students, when they graduate, they aspire to become teaching hospital sub-specialists. And we can reflect on the implications of that. But in terms of, in terms of medical education, uh, there's another problem. And when you think about it, by the end of the 20th, 20th century, certainly now in the 21st century, you have to be really sick or have a rare disease or require some high technology intervention to make it into a teaching hospital. And therefore, uh, and, and often patients don't stay very long because it's so expensive to keep patients in teaching hospitals. And so the effect of that is that medical students have a very limited exposure. And, and this uh, particular graph really emphasizes that. So um, this is a research that was done actually first in 1961 and then repeated in and published in 2001 in the New England Medical Journal. And so it says, well, a thousand people, about 750 have symptoms and, and seek medical attention. One or actually less than one makes it into a teaching hospital. So that's another way in which the, the clinical experience, the exposure to the range of, of health problems that people experience is very limited where, where the medical school is really sticking to the, the pure Flexner model. So what about New Zealand? Well, New Zealand has two universities, or two medical schools associated with two universities. And uh, because of the, the, the concern about uh, the shortage of doctors and, and the need for more doctors to, uh, to serve the populations in New Zealand, there was an increase of 30% in the output of these medical schools over the last 10 years, a 30% increase. Uh, unfortunately, it hasn't really made much of a difference if you're, if you're uh, a community member and looking for a general practitioner, especially uh, in, in rural communities. So only 20% of New Zealand graduates train to be general practitioners, it's even worse, in turn, 3% uh, go into psychiatry. And very few New Zealand graduates choose to serve people living in remote, rural, Maori and Pacific communities. And another issue is that training for general practice and for public health is, is a uh, within New Zealand uh, enterprise. But all of the other training programs for all of the other specialties are overseen by colleges that cover Australia and New Zealand, so Australasian or Australian New Zealand colleges. And so many recent graduates in New Zealand, medical graduates, uh, go to Australia to pursue further training, often more attractive training positions and better pay, and some of them come back, but many of them don't. So we have something like a 20% attrition rate, which does include retirements uh, amongst uh, New Zealand trained doctors. And in fact, New Zealand has never been self-sufficient for doctors, never produced enough doctors to meet the needs of New Zealand, has always relied on overseas trained doctors or international medical graduates. And in round figures, about 40% of the new doctors entering practice each year in New Zealand are, come from other countries. Um, and that, of course, raises questions, especially serving people in, in Maori and Pacific and rural communities uh, about cult cultural competency. There's also the fact that many of them don't stay in New Zealand. They may stay for some years, do some further training, higher qualifications, and then they move on to other countries, sometimes Australia, sometimes back to where they came from. So relying on, on overseas trained doctors is not a really uh, a winning formula, shall we say, for New Zealand. So what about rural medical education? Well, I've described the standard model, and by the, the, the sort of latter half of the 20th century, there was a growing concern in many, many countries uh, that there weren't enough rural doctors and, uh, and, the, and new graduates weren't choosing uh, rural practice. And so that, that led to the idea that maybe if the medical students had some experience in rural practice, they would actually decide to become rural practitioners. And in fact, it was the legislature in Minnesota, the state of Minnesota in the United States that really brought this on. 
because they threatened to cut the funding to the, the University of Minnesota Medical School unless they produced more rural doctors. And then that the uh, Minnesota, University of Minnesota took the plunge and, and started sending not many, but a small number of their medical students out to, to have a whole year living and learning in rural communities. That, that program continues to this day. It's called the Rural Physicians Associates Program, and it's been a great success. And so now we know that that idea actually is true. There's been a lot of research that shows that uh, prolonged, especially prolonged immersive experience, uh, clinical experience in, in rural communities increases the likelihood of, of the, uh, the doctor choosing uh, rural practice as their career. So the research also, now we know, that rural practitioners require a specific range of knowledge and skills, and so that's led to curriculum development around rural medical education. And it's also very clear now that whatever future career path a medical student might be heading towards, the rural setting is a great place to learn clinical medicine because the students see a wide range of clinical problems, they get much more hands-on experience, and so they, they actually develop more quickly a higher level of, of clinical knowledge and, and skills, confidence and competence. So that's a quick window on medical education and rural medical education. I now want to go to Canada. Let's talk about Canada. So you probably recognise the, the map of Canada um, and, and you'll see uh, that there are two red dots. That's a place called Thunder Bay and that's a place called Sudbury. They're both sort of similar to Hamilton in terms of, of, of population. They're a thousand kilometres apart. And this is on the province of Ontario. And this part here is northern Ontario. So looking at, at this map, uh, you can see that, that northern Ontario, these are, these are great lakes here, and this is Hudson Bay and James Bay. And northern Ontario is this land mass that's between them. Northern Ontario is, is vast geographic area. This, this map actually is showing the population distribution. And, and you can see that, uh, so black is sparsely populated. <laughs> it's, uh, there are five population centres greater than 50,000, uh, and most of the communities are 10,000 or less. So uh, a lot of small communities. And the, the, uh, the economy is, is resource-based. So mining, forestry, tourism are the main, uh, the main industries in Northern Ontario. They've never had enough doctors or other health professionals, and the health status of the people of Northern Ontario is worse than the general population of, of Canada. So just to put this in perspective, here's New Zealand. So you know, on this uh, map, instead of black, it's green. Uh, but So the dark green and the slightly lighter green, that's sparse, sparse population. And red is the, is the, is the high density population. And Northern Ontario has something just under 800,000 population. The rural and remote parts, outside the larger, uh, the, the, the main centres and the larger cities of New Zealand, it's roughly 800,000 population. So New, Ze New Zealand isn't as different from Northern Ontario as you might think. But let's talk about Northern Ontario. So back in 2000 and 2001, people right across Northern Ontario said, We'll, when, if we're ever going to have enough doctors and other health professionals, if we're ever going to improve the health of the people of Northern Ontario, we, ne we need our own standalone Northern Ontario School of Medicine. And I'm pleased to say that the, uh, the Ontario government of the day actually accepted that proposition and decided to establish the school. And, and that led to, to Sarah and, and, and me and our five children moving from Australia to Canada to join others in establishing Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So that was in 2002. It took three years to go through the process of, of developing uh, the school and, and meeting the accreditation requirements. So the first student started in 2005. The school serves as the Faculty of Medicine of two universities, Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Laurentian University in Sudbury, and they're a thousand kilometres apart, those, those two universities. And the founding documents that established the school actually set out the social accountability mandate, which is to improve the health of the people and the communities of Northern Ontario. There's also a commitment to innovation. So I, I mentioned social accountability, and I think it's an important concept just to dwell on for a moment. It was in 1995 that the World Health Organization 
defined the social accountability of medical schools and specifically that, that socially accountable medical schools, everything they do, education, research and service, should be addressing the priority health concerns of the population that the school has a mandate to serve. So that's social accountability. Now, as we were starting with Northern Ontario School of Medicine, we looked at the research evidence from around the world and, and we saw that there are three factors that are most strongly associated with going into rural practice after education and training. The first is a rural upbringing, that's having grown up in a rural area. The second factor is positive clinical and educational experiences in the rural setting. Positive clinical and educational experiences in the rural setting as part of the undergraduate education and then after graduation, training that prepares the doctor to practice in the rural setting. So armed with that, that evidence, we went about uh, designing the program, the, the curriculum and so on for the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. And the model that we developed is distributed community engaged learning. So that's the distinctive model of medical education and health research for the Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Distributed means many, many, many sites, actually over 90, 90 sites, where the students and the trainees may undertake part of their, their clinical learning. Now, in order to do that, of course, we rely heavily on electronic communications. Uh, and essentially, if you have the internet, you have access to educational resources and information, pretty much the same as if in the big city, like in a teaching hospital environment. But the centerpiece of distributed community-engaged learning is community engagement. That's the interdependent partnerships with the communities of Northern Ontario. So the, the co-creation and, and co-delivery of the curriculum, of the education program. So this is a, another map um, showing you, it gives you a visual of the, of the over 90 sites uh, spread around Northern Ontario and some in beyond in the southern part of Ontario as well. And the color coding is a different uh, parts of our education program. So for example, this sort of orangey triangle, which includes these communities here, these are remote fly-in, fly-out uh, First Nation communities, so you, you can only get there by airplane, except in the winter when they cut ice roads, so that's how they bring in heavy equipment and, and, and the like. So we asked the, uh, the Indigenous people in Northern Ontario, the First Nations and the Métis people, and we asked them, well, what, what are you expecting of your medical school, and we, we had a special uh, gathering, uh, over 100 Indigenous people from across Northern Ontario, and, uh, we, and this was held at a First Nation, uh, just in the, in the far northwest of, of uh, Northern Ontario. And, and there were many recommendations which then provided the basis for the Indigenous dimension of the school, and the first one was that all of the students should have an immersive cultural experience in the Indigenous communities. So in first year, all of the medical students have four weeks living and learning in the Indigenous communities. And they're there to learn from the community about the history, the tradition, the culture, uh, the social and the health issues of those communities. And Northern Ontario School of Medicine is the only medical school in the world where all of the students have this uh, cultural immersion, especially early on in, in their education. In second year, uh, the students have two uh, what we call integrated community experiences in these rural and remote communities. So uh, these are clinical attachments. They're attached to the doctors and the health team in the small communities, usually a population less than 5,000. And so they're, they're starting to, to learn not just about the, the, the community, but also the, uh, what they've been learning in the classroom, linking that to, uh, to their... Um, uh, to their future practice. And then in third year, uh, the students, uh, they have what's called the Comprehensive Community Clerkship. The students leave uh, Thunder Bay and Sudbury and they move to one of 15 other communities in Northern Ontario and they live in that community for the whole academic year and, and they learn their core clinical medicine in that community. So this is the year when the students make the transition from being classroom learners to clinicians, and the standard model, the flexor model, has students in the teaching hospital, 
And what they do is they do a block rotation in internal medicine, then a block rotation in surgery, then a block in rotation in paediatrics and so on. Northern Ontario School of Medicine, the students are actually living in the community and they're based in general practice and they see patients. So you could say the curriculum walks through the door. The first patient might be a child, that's paediatrics. The next patient might be pregnant, that's obstetrics. The next patient might have a surgical problem. So the learning outcomes for this year, the comprehensive community clerkship, uh, in the six core clinical disciplines, the learning outcomes are just the same as in the other medical schools in Canada, but the learning environment is very different. The students are learning their core clinical medicine from the, the community general practice perspective. And it's actually only uh, in, their, in their fourth year, which is the final year, so it's a four-year graduate entry program, uh, the, that the students then have uh, direct teaching by the specialists and subspecialists in the, in the uh, tertiary care hospitals in, in Sudbury and, and Thunder Bay. So as you can see, a very different uh, a learning environment and curriculum model from, from, the, the, from the standard, from the Flexner model. And there are many curriculum uh, innovations, uh, very much learning in context. So even the classroom with the case-based learning, uh, the cases are complex real life scenarios set in real Northern Ontario communities and certainly in the communities, the, the students are learning uh, about the culture and, and developing uh, cultural competence. But I think that I've highlighted there the, the, the longitudinal learning and, uh, and immersive community engaged education because I've come to realise that's really, that's, that's the secret source, shall we say, uh, of, of Northern Ontario School of Medicine because it's intense interaction with patients that motivates the students to study hard and to learn and to look after their patients. So within two months, those students are talking about going to work rather than going to study and they, they're really part of the health team. So they, they, they're developing that social accountability mindset focused on the health needs of, of their patients and the population they're serving. The other secret, part of the secret source, is that the principal clinical teachers and role models for these students are rural generalists, general practitioners and other uh, general specialists. And I think that, that helps to explain uh, the, the outcomes, which I'll come to shortly. But I just wanted to show you this slide that, uh, that uh, gives you a, an overview of all of the academic activities of the school. You can see they're extensive. You can see that um, although the title is medical school, uh, very much involved in producing a whole range of members of the health team um, uh, with interprofessional education. And the research activities are guided by social accountability. That is, addressing research questions, the answer for which makes a difference to the health of the people of Northern Ontario. And I wanted to just draw your attention to the top half of the slide, uh, because if you look at that, you can see there's a life cycle or the career pathway of, of a doctor or a health professional in Northern Ontario. So the, the science camps are starting at high school level and going through each stage of, of that pathway. And, and I'm going to come back to this concept, but it's something that we've realised is, is very important, a very important element. So it's more than just the three factors associated with going to rural practice, it's, it's connecting uh, the, the stages along the way. So what about the outcomes? Well, um, this is about the admissions process. So given what I said about the, the research evidence, the rural background, et cetera, and the social accountability mandate, we set ourselves the target of reflecting the population distribution of Northern Ontario in each class. So a process that favours applicants from Northern Ontario, and you can see on the one hand it's very competitive, over 2,000 applications each year for 64 places. On the other hand, we've been successful in recruiting students from Northern Ontario. 92% of the students have grown up in Northern Ontario, the other 8% come from remote and rural parts of the rest of Canada. 40% from remote and rural communities is about right for the demographics of Northern Ontario. 7% Indigenous is a bit low. Uh, and so this was, a, this was a review after 10 years and now that we've tweaked the selection admissions process and it's up to 12%, which does reflect the population 
distribution. And I wanted to highlight one other aspect of the slide, which is this here. This GPA stands for grade point average. It's a number out of four. And 3.7 is the same as the other medical schools in Canada when students are entering medical school. So we haven't sacrificed academic standards to, to uh, well, in Toronto they would have said to let in all these dumb northerners. So what about the student experience? These are some, uh, some quotes from students uh, from different research that, that was undertaken. And, and you'll see, uh, you know, for example, this one, we're better off. We actually get to, to learn more being in the rural centre rather than in the big teaching hospital. But I think it's this last one that I've highlighted that really sums it up. You don't know it until you live it. You don't know it until you live it. And if that, like, this is really the opposite of the Flexner model. It's learning in the community and clinical setting where you expect the, the, doc, the future doctor to actually provide care. So what about the career directions? Well, I said I'd come back to that, and here it is. 62% of the graduates have chosen general practice. Uh, that's mostly a rural general practice training that they've chosen. That's almost double the national average for Canada going into general practice for the other medical schools. You may recall that New Zealand is 20% of New Zealand medical graduates go into general practice. In Canada, when the, that figure got down to 25%, the alarm bells were ringing and the red flags went up and government started investing more both in training and in making general practice a more attractive uh, career direction for, for doctors. The next, uh, uh, the next line in that slide says 33% general specialties. That's 62 plus 33. That's the 95% that was mentioned in the introduction. So the general specialties are general medicine, general surgery, pediatrics, and so on, including psychiatry. Um, and so 95% of the graduates have chosen to be generalists in, in, uh, across the medical specialties. The other 5% are, the, are, going to, are going into subspecialties. And that 5% is really important to us. So we're talking about dermatologists and radiation oncologists and neurologists. That, that's really important to us because in Northern Ontario, we need those subspecialists. Yeah, they have to go elsewhere for training, but they, but they are coming back. It's also important another way because even though the, the, the learning environment curriculum model is very different in Northern Ontario from the other medical schools, our students or our graduates are really competitive. Like there are a small number of first year training positions in each of these subspecialty training programs each year. And essentially, if our, uh, if our students, our graduates choose that career pathway, they're successful in matching to those careers. Um, there's a national match, so the, going into, into postgraduate training in Canada, and uh, the first group of graduates from the school, they were all matched in the first round. That was the first time at that time uh, for over 15 years that any, for any medical school in Canada that the whole class would be matched in the first round. And that pattern has continued, not every year, but most years for Northern Ontario and for other schools, uh, in Canada, there's now a concern that some Canadian medical graduates aren't getting into any postgraduate training. So uh, they're high quality graduates from Northern Ontario School of Medicine that are sought after to train in any specialty and subspecialty. The bottom half of the slide is looking at then after a postgraduate training and you can see that those who, who, who did their undergraduate and their postgraduate training in Northern Ontario, 94% are practicing in Northern Ontario. So what about the impact of the school more generally on, on the region, on Northern Ontario? And we've done uh, research a couple of times now looking at the economic impact and also the social impact of the school. And uh, in, in 2017, the budget for the school was $43 million. That's taxpayers' money. The level of new economic activity in Northern Ontario in that year was something over $120 million. So it's more than a two-for-one a multiplier effect or return on investment. And this is, this is positive, not just for the larger population centres, but also this benefit flows through to uh, the smaller communities and it's economic development. So there are job categories in Northern Ontario that wouldn't be there without a medical school. In terms of the social impact, well, first of all, 
uh, much uh, greater success in recruitment and, and uh, retention of doctors and other members of the health workforce. We did a study looking at eight communities that before the school uh, had 30, three zero full-time equivalent vacancies. At the time of the study, they had one vacancy. They'd gone from being in crisis mode, trying to fill gaps uh, next week and next month, to planning ahead, and they were spending less money on recruitment. But I think probably the most important social impact was this sense of, of, of collective community empowerment, summed up by the phrase, if we can do a successful medical school, we can do anything. So NOSM, Northern Ontario School of Medicine, uh, has, has, has actually provided many benefits to Northern Ontario. More generalist doctors and other health uh, professionals who are members of the health team and are responsive to the, the social and cultural diversity of Northern Ontario, as well as the benefits of the research and the uh, academic and the economic uh, development as well. I mentioned generalism a bit, so I just want to focus on this. This is based on research that we did studying students and graduates of Northern Ontario School of Medicine about their experience of generalism in rural practice. And, and this is the conclusion, really, from that study, that it's not that somehow, uh, you know, it's better to be a specialist and subspecialist with the services I provide are better. It's different. And that, that really rural generalist care, you know, it's, it's high-quality care, within the realities of the, of the uh, geography, demography, cultural context, human ma and material resources of the rural communities. And the other important finding was that the experiences of the students and graduates actually helped them to, to choose what career direction, uh, what, what specialty and, the, and the, the scope of and location of their practice. So lest you think that generalism is just about general practice. This is the definition of generalism coined by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of, of Canada. So that's all of the specialties except general practice. And you can see that uh, they, uh, they, and their definition is common, in common with others, that it's about a wide range of services uh, provided as part of a health team that's focused on addressing the health needs of the population that's being served. So generalism is an important uh, concept, really, in all of this. And going a step further, and I, I highlighted uh, the, on the top part of the slide of the academic activities with NOSM in Northern Ontario, is, what's, is actually now we have the research evidence. So more than the three factors that we have the research evidence that shows if you're really going to ensure the supply, recruitment and retention of doctors and health professionals in rural communities, you need to have a facilitated career pathway that starts at high school and actually indigenous communities probably even in, in starting in primary school, that's what we do in Northern Ontario, encouraging the young people to see a future them, for themselves which might include a career in healthcare and studying medicine. And so it's motivating and, and raising the, uh, the bar, so to speak, the expectations of young people in these, these remote rural and, and indigenous communities. And then having a selection process that favours applicants from those communities and then provides most of their, their education actually in those community and, and clinical settings. After graduation then training, that prepares them with including enhanced skills to serve those, those rural communities as rural generalists and then supporting them to stay in those communities with, with uh, uh, con continuing professional development. So let's come back to New Zealand just for a minute. Um, you know, I've, I've highlighted already that uh, the, the worse health status uh, of people living in rural Maori Pacific communities in, in New Zealand and relatively, access, and they're underserved in terms of access to care. They're also underrepresented in terms of the uh, medicine and, and other health professions. And so it seems to me that that provides the, the basis for New Zealand to at least explore uh, the notion of a new and different medical school, different from the, the, the standard model, which is Auckland and, and, and Otago. And one difference would be to recruit students who already have a university degree and may have other life experience before they've decided they really want to study medicine. And then providing uh, those students so who've come from the underrepresented, underserved uh, communities with most of their clinical education, so immersive, 
distributed community engaged education in those rural and underserved settings. So that's something I think is worth thinking about for New Zealand. And it, you can't these days do a presentation without mentioning COVID-19 pandemic. <laughs> um, and that, that uh, certainly has made a lot of differences. It brought into sharp focus the uh, well already known uh, inequities and disparities for uh, rural and, and Maori communities, and Pacific communities in, in New Zealand and, and so on. But also if you look at the one, uh, the highlighted item at the bottom of the slide, you know, uh, the, it was feasible to provide telehealth and it was feasible to deliver education online, but it was seen as, well, not really as good. Now, not only is the impossible possible, but it's seen as the way of the future. And in fact, to the point, I mean, this university, more or less overnight, went to delivering all of its coursework online. So that means we can have students, medical students and other health profession students living and learning in their own community and just occasionally coming here to the university and to Hamilton. So that, you know, the pandemic has done us a favor. It's opened up uh, opportunities and possibilities that maybe just didn't seem to be there before. Anyway, it's time to wrap all of this up. Uh, we've been on a bit of a journey, uh, starting with what we all expect in terms of health care, uh, looking at the realities of, of rural health, uh, medical education, rural medical education, and the success of Northern Ontario School of Medicine in producing graduates who had the skills and the commitment to serve uh, people who, who are most in need of care. But let's go back to the original proposition, which is how rural medical education improves health care for all. And I think you can see now that rural medical education produces better doctors, whether they become subspecialist neurosurgeons or uh, whatever specialty they choose, they, kn they know and understand the rural context and the, and the cultural dimensions. They're focused and understand the importance of the health needs of the population they're serving and they, they appreciate generalism. And at least some of them, and probably a lot more of them, would actually choose to be rural practitioners. So we came back to where we began with the title. Uh, there are some references for those who want to follow this up. And I do want to highlight um, uh, this reference here. So Dr. John Burton is here, I believe. John, will you stand up and take a bow? So, so, thank you, John. You can give him a round of applause if you like. So John is a GP in Carfia, and in 2017 he spent three months travelling across northern Ontario, and so this paper that he published in 2019 uh, talks about his experience, but connects that experience to the New Zealand context. Okay, that's it. Uh, the final slide is telling you about the next uh, Hamilton public lecture, so I'll say thank you very much, everyone.